So everyone can hear? Yeah, let's let them know. Yeah, yeah, we're on. Hi, everybody. Hope you all are well. Thanks for tuning in. Um, we're going to wait a minute or two here. Um, we have some connection issues. So hopefully you guys hang tight and we'll have um, our special guest and presenter here on shortly. Hey, hey, how are you? Hey, Ben. Good. I apologize. I was getting out of a, a meeting with technical leadership, and it went it went later than I anticipated. So I apologize. Yeah. No, no, no David, worries. All good. Over how night. you guys doing? Good. Well, thanks. How are you? You you ready to go here? Let's go. Awesome. Thanks again, everybody. Um, my name is Jesus Mata. Uh, despite what my screen says. Um, and on behalf of NorCal and the Latino Committee, we'd like to thank you all for coming on today's webinar. Uh, just a few reminders. I'm sure everybody is pretty well versed in, in the Zoom world by now and on uh, webinars that NorCal has hosted. But this webinar is in the webinar function. So everybody's cameras are automatically off as well as their uh, microphones. If you would like to submit questions, please do so through the Q&A function down at the bottom uh, bar of the Zoom platform. Eh, si gustan someter preguntas en español, por favor háganlo a través de la función Q&A que se encuentra uh, en la parte de abajo de la plataforma de Zoom. Eh, daremos la pregunta en inglés y daremos la traducción eh, en español para los que gusten someter las preguntas en español. Um, so, uh, without any further ado, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Benjamin to say a few opening words and to uh, present our guest presenter today. Benjamin. Yeah, I, okay. Um, I will cut to the chase and we, so we can get moving and, and value everyone's time. Thank you very much for coming on. Um, and we look forward to your presentation. So everyone knows um, you're in a critical moment, right? With your season. And um, you, in my opinion, having watched your team play, I missed Colorado match, but I think that's a one-off. I see um, your, your style and everything emerging and have uh, look forward with interest to see how you, um, in your third season, I believe, that you, um, you continue this development and see how this team evolves. So I uh, wish you luck and, and uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Ben. I appreciate the words. And um, obviously, I know you through just the community of, of the coaches in youth soccer, youth national teams. Um, you work closely with Mikey Vadas, who's an assistant here with us at FC Dallas. I believe he's done this type of format with you guys. Uh, I think more in a presentation mode. I know this is more Q&A, but, uh, but, but Mikey's had nothing but amazing things to say in his experience with you and learning from you and if he's learning from you then 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 that's a great mind and that's a great experience that that uh, i hope to learn from as well as as time goes by and i i i take these moments very seriously because uh i come from 
youth development. I am a product of youth development. Uh, when I was done playing, I was a teacher. Uh, I was an algebra teacher. I was a U10 girls coach. I was a U12 boy, boys coach. I became a boys director uh, for Kendall soccer. I became an academy coach then with FC Dallas. And I got to do that full time. And then I gave up the teaching, but it's still teaching to me, but teaching the game uh, and having those experiences and, and going through that process. Uh, I'm hopeful I can just share any insight I have that, I, that can help all of you in what you do and, and what you do is so important. And and uh, and I have a lot of respect for, for you all and, and taking this game to the next level and helping our young players in this country um, reach their potential uh, on and off the field. So pleasure to be here, Ben. Thank you for the welcome. Pleasure to be here, David. Oh, sorry, it's not David. No, that's the wrong uh, name. Huh? Yeah, I'm, I'm Jesus. So just sorry, Jesus. Today, I... today on today on screen, I'm David. You tricked me with your screen name, but uh, oh, all good. But again, glad to be here and and to share this moment with you and and share any insight that I can. All right, I've got a question. Um, I'll start off. Uh, you've signed 21 homegrown players since you've been the head coach. Only? And what's that? Yeah. Only? Oh, yeah. Well, hey, hey, yeah. That, for me, that's, a, that's an accomplishment. And to, um, it's, all, it's a challenge to blood these new players, bring them in, see them leave. And um, I would like to know what, what things did you see in them early on? Did you see it early on? Or were there ones that you didn't see it and then they developed it? And, and how is it to, to be uh, trying to achieve, you know, uh, MLS level with bringing in so many young players? Yeah, um, it's funny when you say the number, you forget, right? How, how many players have come through the system? And I think we've signed over 30 total in the program. Okay. We just signed our 30th or 31st. I, I forget, we, we're losing count, but, um, and, and, you know, not all of them are active, right? So we don't get it always right or perfect. Um, and I know, Ben, you've coached youth national teams and you've seen uh, guys that maybe at the U15, U16 national team level, you thought, man, this kid's special. He's an impact. He's a protagonist. But but then you get to U19 or you get to that pre-professional age at hitting 20, 21, which is now professional and something uh, doesn't pan out, right? And, and then you have other ones that whether it was through physical late development qualities uh, or just mental uh, challenges and as they developed and with their confidence going up and down and, and, uh, and then players that, 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 that maybe were not uh, or were in the shadows of others somehow uh, excel and, and grow into the, uh, a, a better potential and and have careers and maybe are some of our greatest players so i think sam vines is maybe like one of those kind of yeah. guys i think you coach sam yeah um, in national team and he was a he was a late developer physically he he oh, yeah. was really he was overlooked in many uh moments uh, in yeah. but but there was something there he, he had a he had a intense intensity to his game yeah. he was he was savvy he had the left foot he could support the attack and now he's a starting left back with with colorado and now he's on the national team pool so that's a great example but for me, in my experience, um, Ben, you know, it's hard. I, I want to say FC Dallas, just the culture and environment here at the club is, has taught me, right? From I left uh, Kendall Soccer 2012, Ju Ju June of 2012, and joined FC Dallas to be a full-time U18 head coach. And I remember I shadowed Chris Hayden for two months with the prior U18 team. And they were making their run through playoffs and they win the national championship. And that's a team with guys like Kellen Acosta, who's a 95 playing up with the 93s. And you have guys uh, like Aaron Guion, who's still a professional. We signed him to the first team. He, he played a few years, but now he's in USL championship. Um, you have, you have some, uh, some players in the midfield that, that were, man, fantastic players. Amazing. This is a national championship team, you know, and, and not all these guys uh, were signed, obviously. Not all these guys made it. They, most all of them played collegiately, and just a few of them played professionally. And then you have a player like Kellen, who's not in our club anymore, who's now playing on the senior national team. He's with Colorado, but he's on the senior national team. Yeah. So, so that was my first kind of taste of seeing a player signed, young age, teenager, and then uh, make, now he's, you know, he's had, he has a career. Uh, and then 
I started to coach the following year, the year after, and the, between the 16 and the 18 age groups, you 19, 16 age groups. Um, and I learned, I learned from uh, the experience. Uh, I, I think, I think what I can be honest about is in Dallas, and, and now I'm going to share why I think players that have come through FC Dallas have had professional uh, careers now, whether in MLS or in Europe or in other clubs. I'm going to give you a, a stat. Uh, we're, we're the number one domestic MLS club that is the, the, in developing players to play professionally. Okay. Okay. So we have the most players in the world. If you count South America, Central America, Europe, and North America. So MLS, Bundesliga, uh, even La Liga, La, uh, Liga Mekis in Mexico, some, some few leagues in South America. We have the most players in professional that have, that have developed uh, through an MLS academy, MLS academy. Yeah. And we're just really, really proud of that. I think Dallas, just to start off, Dallas is a very competitive youth sports market yeah. you have uh, football basketball there's so many facilities there's indoor centers outdoor centers there's fields galore there's so many people. fields there's people there's organizations i think there's i think we have one of the highest registration of youth athletes in all the sports boys and girls it's just a great it's a volume there's volume and then within with that volume there's this competitive structure a dallas parent is crazy <laughs> i know yeah. I know you have crazy parents. Yeah. We have some of the craziest parents and they're so competitive. You've got kids winning and if, you know, these football flag football championships with, and they're, they've worn the, these fat rings with, with yeah. rhinestones on them. Cause they're not, they're not going to put a, a diamond on a 10 year old, but there's like bragging rights. There's yeah. a, there's, it's just hyper competitive in the U 10 to U 19 premier soccer. So not Academy, but premier soccer. There's four divisions and there's relegation and promotion. Yeah. Which sounds true. like, sounds kind of backwards. Like, wow, Wait, wow. What, what age? I'm sorry. From U11 all the way to U19, it's promotion relegation. There's four yeah. divisions and it's promotion relegation. Okay. Germany and Holland. There you go. Germany so what it, what it creates is hyper competitiveness. Yeah. Not just of the players, of the, of the parents, of the coaches. It's, you would say this is unhealthy, right? I mean, this is not good. The, the, there's pressure. The, the kids are they, they're expected to win at a really young age and, and it takes away from their development. And you know what? There, there's something in that pressure. There's something in that stress that actually develops these kids to be very competitive and very proud. Um, yeah. Go to Argentina and tell me and go watch a U12 game in Argentina and tell me that there's a, there's a good site that you take an American psychologist to a U12 Argentina game and they're going to think this is horrible for this, for these kids. This is backwards. This is creating anxiety, nervousness, pressure. They're going to burn out. No, these kids deal with it from a young age and they excel and they handle the pressure from their families, from the teams, from winning, from losing kids cry in Argentina. When they lose the U12 game, they cry, they cry. Their day, their, their week is done until they can play the next game. And so you actually get a taste of that in Dallas in our youth leagues. It's yeah, crazy. Yeah. I go to my, my son's game and I, I sit in a corner in the shade under the tree. I don't bark directions on my kid. I let the coach do, do that. But it's like, I, I'm not, a, I don't feel that, but I can see how that environment actually creates competitive players. Now, I think there needs to be a balance to it, right? It's not, it shouldn't just be mayhem and craziness screaming at a referee why it wasn't a handball in a U8 girls game and creating a, this, this distraction that I think is not healthy entirely. But in that promotion and relegation environment and this youth competitive environment, there's something about it that I do believe creates competitiveness. Yeah. So I think it's up to us to be responsible and take the best out of that, right? How can we create competitiveness, develop competitiveness? I think it's important. I think it's important. I know we want our players to play um, and look, this is now where I take that competitive nature that you have in youth soccer players in Dallas clubs are competing. You guys have, I'm sure a very similar type dynamic in your own way, but that's, that's my, what yep. I can share in Dallas. Yep. Take that and take the FC Dallas facility, yep. a beautiful facility with a lot of fields, a lot of space, um, academy coaches that, uh, that I think have great, you know, they have a better licensing. They're teaching the game. Uh, the right way, I believe, with 
a lot of ball possession purpose with it. So playing through the thirds, not afraid to play out of the back, not skipping lines, playing through, but reading the game too, when you need to skip lines and, and then a transition to get pressure on the ball. So we're talking about style of play and idea of the game here that I think we're proud in how we want to implement it. We're not perfect. We, I still walk around and I think we need, we can still do much better, but you, you take this now competitive player with, with talent, you put them in an environment where they're being taught the game, I believe in a positive way for their development. And then you, and then in the club, it's competitive. So these guys are getting training, playing up age groups. You have 15, 16 year olds training with our second team. Before it was a 16, 17 year old training with our first team, which we still do. Last year was a challenge because of the pandemic, but now we're doing it much better because of the vaccine and the bubbles are now open. So we're back to, we were depressed last year. I'm not going to lie. We weren't able to integrate as much with our age groups and our people. And now it's open again and we're able to have that integration. So our, our players, U15, U17, U19, they train in the early morning. And they, because we have a partnership with the city, the school district, these players are training at the same time as the second team and the first team, side by side. So they're getting reps with, with the pro team. They're, they're getting a visual reference of what it takes to play at that speed, with that intensity, with that creativity, with that transition. And it's just shared. And every day, different players are called up or down, and you need to be on your toes. And, um, and if you get called one day, you're not guaranteed to be called tomorrow. So it depends on the needs. There's always inter-squad games. So there's that integration that's intentional because of the school schedule and they get PE credit for doing the morning trainings, the academy players. So I think that's an element. We do a lot of international tournaments. So uh, something that we always create as an objective is by the time a player is a U19 academy player, they need to have at least 50 international club games. From, so from the U10 to all the way U19, uh, every player coming through our system has to have at least 40 – 40 to 50 international club games, not, not just inter, not national team players going on a national team trip, actually playing club teams from Mexico, from uh, South and Central America, from Europe, hosting it here or going to a tournament domestically or going overseas. And I know these are big investments, but you put that, you, you add that up. And those are amazing experiences of playing different styles of play, different cultures and languages different talent levels, different systems. And these players, they learn to compete against international players. I think it's super valuable. And it, you can see Weston McKinney, I know he didn't sign with our first team. He went to Germany at a young age, but before he was 17, that kid had a, a bunch of international club games yep. that allowed that player to, to get an ingre different ingredients uh, of the international game, the international game and competing for a trophy. And in an international competition. So I think that's really an, another important element. And uh, we can go into like player profiles and what yeah, we, we have some look at. So, you know, but that, I hope that gives you just an idea yeah, of this, this, this kind of conundrum yeah. of uh, ingredients. You put this, these ingredients together with why is there talent in Dallas? Talent, Dallas has Latin American, uh, yeah. you know, demographic, just like you guys. We've got different kids with different profiles of athleticism, whether it's coordination or speed or power, we've got it all, man. We've got kids from all over the world. Dallas is pretty diverse. We've got fields. So you put all those things together and, and I think, uh, and, and you put a pathway. Now we have a second team that improves our pathway. And I, yep. and I, I think it's, it's not a surprise. You got these kids that, that they're not ready. No one's ever ready. I wasn't ready to be a pro coach. I wasn't ready. My name got called. And I, even though I wasn't ready, I was in an environment that prepared me and is going to continue to prepare me. And I could, yep. I'm at the highest level in the club. So my, I'm the only guy that needs to worry about winning or losing. The rest needs to worry about developing, sending me players. But I'm not afraid to lose my job. And if I lose it because of I don't get the result, you know what? I'm learning every day here. And I'm thankful that, that, uh, that, that I'm prepared. And I'm, I'm going to be prepared whether I'm here for 10 more years and winning MLS Cup or it's going to be at the next club. But it's about being prepared. None of us are ready for that next step. And the same goes for these young players playing. Oh, he's not ready to play up. He's not ready to play. He's never going to be ready until you give him the opportunity. That's and the impressive part, I think, is that at the end of all of it, you all I've been around the world studying at clubs and there's impressive youth models. But unless they get the chance by the first team coach 
or they have a second team for the step and then get the chance, it means nothing. Or they get they go somewhere else. And that's where it's impressive to me that the organization has made a commitment and hired somebody like you that is willing to use these younger players because that's in the end you have to, or they just get uh, you know bottled up. So absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Every every talent needs somewhere to so players need to play. That's that's where I'm proud of our pathway now. We've got now a second team where you have young first team players. If they're not getting, you know, good minutes with the first team. Now they have the opportunity to get minutes with the second team. Yeah, uh, We used to do that with the first team in the U19s, and there was still this big bridge. Now we do it with the second team, which has been very helpful. In fact, we've got some first-team players that are going to play this, this weekend with our second team, and they're going to get ready to be a first – they're going to re be ready to help the first team the following week. So that's, what, that's really important to your point, Ben. And I will say in our pathway, this is something that has been, uh, I think, really helpful for us in – creating options for our players because a lot of our young American players, they have this dream to play in, in Europe and in Champions League and, and they should, it's a great ambition. It's a great ambition. And, um, but, but why can't they do that through the, through good communication and good support and a pathway through your American club, your, through, through your MLS or amateur club. So I think partnerships with uh, clubs in Europe or a club in Europe, I think is important. Um, we have a partnership with Bayern Munich. All of our young players get training opportunities with Bayern. And not just that, they get training opportunities with Bayern's extended network. Uh, we have players that have played a season in Austria now, coming from our academy that weren't getting enough minutes in our first team. And then they played a professional season in Austria in first division. And they're, be they're taking their steps. So there's so many steps in that pathway to the very highest level. Dallas is just one. MLS yeah. is just one. And we got to be willing to help support these players come through Dallas or around Dallas, or out of the system of Dallas, but back in the system of Dallas. Colleges out of our system, maybe yep. come back into our system. Reggie Cannon had to do that for one year. That was the plan, but that that's what had to work for him, as opposed to another player like Paxton Pomacola comes all straight through the youth yep. to the first team. Is or there you have someone like Justin Che, who comes through our youth academy, second team, Bayern Munich. Does he stay there? Does he does he continue with us? Those are that's the future. Yep. The future is open, and but we have to be ready to provide pathways. If we think our current path, only path, one path is the only one, then we're I think we're naive and yeah, we're and, limiting and our, our it, Yeah. Is there any feedback that you're getting from European clubs that is a trend in weaknesses or strengths of the players that you're sending over there? And what are you doing to correct it or that's improve a, it? That's a good question. We we talk about that internally. Our players are again very competitive. They um, they, they adapt quickly um, in in the whatever the culture they. So for example, the players that go to Bayern, the feedback is always really positive. There's always a few players that they want to keep, but then we've got to bring some guys back for our first team, or or we let them stay if we don't think they're ready to really impact the first team yet. But um, so we try to manage that and take it case by case. So one of the things that I I think is is correct is there's still this lack of uh, this pure uh, technical ability. You know, I, I think um, our players still catch up. We're still catching up technically. Um, and, and then not just the technical uh, ability, but applying it with a, with a decision, right? So a skill. I think uh, our players are doing it better in our country. Unfortunately, uh, I just think we're not doing that enough at the youngest, youngest ages. So you talk, you know, zone one, grassroots. Yeah you know, U6, U7, U8, I think we can still do a much better job of developing, of course, ball mastery. Yeah, you, you having a comfort with the ball, um, but giving it a coordination and giving it a decision. So I'm not a fan of like just all ball mastery up until you're 10 years old and you and a ball, and then you have no idea of how to scan. You don't know how to take in information and check your shoulders. You don't know how to recognize a teammate, an opposition, time, space. A direction with the ball you i think just ball mastery you come it's like a, you're almost becoming a circus act of a, of a of a player you can do a halftime show with the ball but are, are, do you know how to apply technique to the real game the speed of the game then and, and make consistent decisions so i'm a big believer that those youngest ages should be doing ball mastery and always complementing it with associations two versus zero two players passing and 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 going from A to B. So there's just a recognition of the weight of the pass, 
uh, the movement, then add a three versus zero. Ah, now there's maybe more depth. Now you can add a width, uh, add four versus zero. Now there's more depth in front, depth in back. You got width, now you had five versus zero. Oh, now you have a player between the lines. So you just, I, I really believe in building connections with teammates and combining and associating and complement that always with ball mastery. Uh, I, I, I feel like we have too many kids that can do amazing things with the ball, but they don't know how to hit a 40 yard driven ball on his teammate's chest or to the front foot or, or play a, a, a simple Rondo or win in a two versus one with combination. So I think duels and like uh, association play like two versus zero, five versus zero, five versus one Rondo. I think, I think duels Rondo's, and ball mastery needs to be in every moment of training for those youngest, youngest ages so that they get those. That's what the, you, Ben, you've been all over the world. Yep. You've been to Spain. You've, I'm sure you've been to Germany. Yep. And I feel like we're still catching up in that way. Um, and I think we have a lot of good, great young coaches that do it, but we just don't do it enough. You know, yeah, I agree. Hijack Split presented for us a, a while ago, and they don't allow their teams to move above uh, in their small sided games above five players with a keeper until under 16s and they say they want these small-sided football repetition in addition to the technique they need to have this footballerish quality where they feel the game yeah. and it can only come through playing a great deal and they have to compensate it and they have to force their coaches i'm a firm believer in that that was something mikey i thought was a master of is using small side game. it's it's a skill to develop the ability to train yeah. concepts and technique through small sided football. Yeah. And, and that would be that last element of, okay, I said one, two, three ball mastery associations yeah. and rondos and duels, but then you got to play. You yeah. got to play every kid. Needs to, oh, that's why you have kids from the street in South America. They were never in a structured system until maybe 13, 14 yeah. in a, in a youth pro team, a youth pro club or Academy, but they're gene, they're brilliant players technically. And in terms of decision, they're because of the the street ball because they're playing they're getting that stimulus so we've got to create that almost artificially right um you have some kids maybe in certain parts of the city that get that that street ball uh, instinct but we still got to create that artificially everything is a little too structured for me too much about ball mastery not so much about understanding and playing the game um because that's the game is is the best teacher right the game yeah. is the best teacher and we have to know how to manage uh, our environments with these players and we don't have them for very long or for very often per week. So we've got to be so efficient. Yeah. We've got to be so efficient in the time that we have with them to, to, to develop these, these, uh, these elements in, in the yeah. players. Hey, there's a great question that sort of leads into this. Um, the parents clearly are an important part of a player's youth development because they bring them to training, they make the commitment and they can, uh, a lot of clubs really use the parents as our view, the parents as allies. What's your interaction? What's your program for, you know, enlisting um, the parent support in, in this? That's a, that's a good question. I, when I first started coaching, I was done playing. I played eight years uh, after college and I started to coach in my, my seventh, eighth year. I, I did some side camps and I knew so, there was something in it I liked in, in coaching and sharing uh, and teaching uh, these young players that they were like sponges about the game. And I did it like from a player perspective. I, I, when I started to coach, I remember always the feedback with parents was like, you know, keep them away with big distance and keep them away, create clear boundaries. And, and uh, you know, I, I understand that you need to have your, your, your boundaries with the parents, but you have to work with the parent. You have to work with the parents, uh, with these players. Uh, I could tell you right now, we would have never signed these, these players to professional contracts if we didn't create good, positive, honest, transparent relationships with the families and the parents. Every kid's got a home that's a little bit different. It's a different dynamic. Um, and it's so important that, that we understand their home. We understand their parents. When you understand their parents, you understand the player better. And the player's going to trust you more. It uh, doesn't mean you're going to decide everything and everything's uh, fluffy and, 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 uh, and perfect for that player. But, you know, you, you got to create your high standards uh, for, for the player, whether you're, you, you like the parents or not, but it's not about liking or not. It's, it's just about understanding. Uh, I do. I'm a, I'm a believer when I was an Academy director, I always encouraged our uh, coaches to build relationships. Now at U17, U19, 
I, I challenge now the coaches to create a, more independence with the player, more autonomy with the player. Not We don't need play, uh, parents coddling them anymore, but you still need to have communication with the parent because that teenager is still going to a home every night talking with mom and dad. And, and if you, if you improve a player's mindset or, or attitude and at home, they're being told the opposite and it's not in line with, with how you're trying to teach them about being a good teammate, be, uh, focusing, uh, transitioning, uh, you know, respecting, then, then all your work is lost. You're only with them, what, an hour and a half a day and for a few times a week and, their home is so important. So if, the more you can educate the home and connect with the home, uh, the better impact and effect you're going to have with the player on the field. Uh, so I, I highly encourage you take the time. And look, I know some coaches maybe on here that this, this is part-time or, or it's one-third of their time to, to be able to coach. And, that, and that's, that's noble of you to, to do this because you're passionate about it. But, but if you're going to do it right, you're going to do it well, you need to set aside time to connect with, with the parents, understand them and maybe have hard conversation. Don't be afraid to have hard conversations and tell and put them in their place um, and educate them, but also listen and, and just have, have be open to, to I, I find that when you, you're not always right or wrong with a parent, but if you're open and honest and many times it doesn't work out, but if you're open and honest, you're going to, you're going to create a great environment for your players and you're going to create an environment. You're going to, you're going to get the most out of your players. So that, that would be my, all right. My, my two cents on, on, okay. on the, the parent. We have interesting here. Um, this is hosted by our Latino committee. And we have somebody that asked, how much does FC Dallas reach out to the Latino committee, a community in Dallas? And how do you do it? Um, so we have uh, FC Dallas South. It's something new that I was a part of starting um, with, with very strong support of our leadership and our ownership. We have a facility uh, in MoneyGram, which is in West Southwest Dallas, and then we have a facility on Mercy Street, which is, uh, you know, I would say inner city south of downtown, and it's a it's a really uh, great culture to, to to start your own FC Dallas extension and program uh, in these areas where it's, you know, these kids don't have access up to here in Frisco, North Dallas, to our facility. There's traffic. It's a commute. So I, I'm really proud that we have made some conscious efforts to connect with our Latin communities and and even non-Latin communities in those areas to 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 just connect with them and and create a, a support and a pathway for their young their young uh, their their young player their their players. But I, I think we could do more. I think we don't do enough. Uh, I think we're trying, uh, but all of this takes time and energy. So you know I, I continue to challenge us in the club, the youth club, the academy to. To have a uh, you know reach out and have and build more, I would say more more of a network, more of a, a connection with the with the Latin community because uh, they're really important to, to to our city and we have a lot of fans, Latin fans and our you know most of our demographic of our fans is North Dallas, right? So we don't yeah. just because of the, lo the location, yeah. Uh, but yeah, but we take pride in that and and the, but there's there's plenty of uh, pockets of Latin communities that. I believe we can connect more with. So that's something we want to continue to, to, to improve. But I think it's really, it's really important. It's the future. It's the future. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you know, we're in Texas. The border is with Mexico. Shoot, we're, <laughs> we're, we're on the border with, you know, in California the same. So I, I love our diversity and you see it in our teams. I'm sure you see it in yours, the, the Latin American mix. Uh, we're proud of it. And, but, but we got to continue to support because some of those areas, those kids don't have resources or, or the ability to be a part of our club. And we've got to, we've got to work extra hard to, to, to create pathways for them. Uh, if they have, if they've earned the opportunity to, to, to be in our club one day, we've got to create better pathways. Cause we're, we're, I still feel like we're maybe missing uh, talent or, yeah. or opportunities for the, some of these young players that, that need support and resources. Okay. Interesting. Hey, in the global FIFA report on competitiveness that Arsene Wenger is involved in the technical side, he spoke about the challenges of bringing young players up into the first team when they had technical deficiencies, um, when they he didn't have time to bring them up to speed because you're working on a on a uh, obviously the team performance. Uh, so he thought that um, it had to come like this finalization, 16s to 19s. Um, 
is that something you guys do? Do you have, um, how do you use IDPs, like individual yeah. development plans to hone in on the players that you've, you've decided, okay, now these are the ones. It's interesting that, that, that you also, uh, you know, that study with, with Arson. Uh, I had the pleasure of uh, doing an interview for Arsen Wenger for my pro license uh, three months ago. Three months ago, nice. And we actually talked a little bit of this topic as well, and what he experienced, and how we're learning those lessons here uh, in terms of IDPs and, and that that pre-professional to professional age, and what it is that they're still developing. Right. Um, I think we're one of the only sports where a 17-year-old can actually physically be developed enough to play professional games at the highest level. You see it. You saw, you saw it with Mbappe. You saw it with Neymar. I mean, these are special right. talents. Messi. But you still see it. Go to Uruguay. Go to Uruguay and league, and you've got 17-year-olds all over the league playing professionally. And, and you're seeing it more in our country and, and in the U.S. But, um, yeah, I, I would agree with that. These, these players, I, they're not technically, for me, uh, at, their, at their nearest ceiling, at their at – their, you know, 99.99% of their ceiling. To me, they're not there technically till they're about 22, 23 years old. Um, they're probably at 95%, 90, 90 to 95%, you know, at 17, 18. But then there's still, that last 5% is, is, is hard. It's hard to, to, to fill that gap, but it, but it is absolutely, absolutely able to fill. And, and, and you heard that with Arson about IDPs and it's, it's about reps. It's about getting reps in situations to use those techniques and to, to decide whether with those techniques, sometimes they're not getting it fully with the first team. So we have a coach. We, this is something we addressed last year. We felt we, we needed extra support uh, for our 17s to U23 age group, for all of our players from the, sec, from the academy to the second team to the first team. So we hired a coach who we call uh, our IDP coach. He's the U23 director of talent development and his name is Chuy Rivera he's also he's like on staff with the first team but he is in charge with creating IDP plans so he sits down and has uh, talks with the players he talks about tactical things he'll just sit down and do video sessions with them he'll he'll do a video of their training a video of their second team game a video of their academy game and he'll go over tactical things with that player and then on the field he'll always set up a uh, time each week to do 15 20 minutes of extra reps crossing finishing hitting diagonal balls, clearing, uh, one-on-one footwork and, and angling of the pressure for an outside back, you know, all these different themes. He creates these, uh, these progressions for the players based on what we feel they're still deficient and they, they need to improve. And sometimes not what they're deficient. It's actually what they're really good at, but we want them to master it. So I'm a fan of not just working on your opposite foot, like master your dominant foot and complement it with developing your opposite foot because you know, Messi, how many times is he really using his right? He's a master of his left foot. So I think we get sometimes uh, you, you hear about opposite foot this or if you work always on your weaknesses, then you're not you're not mastering your strength. So that's something that we always encourage in our IDPs, like make sure they're getting reps of what they actually do really well also. But that's how we uh, we've addressed it in our club uh, for the last year and a half. We've had an IDP coach and uh, and we're, we're really happy with the, the impact of it. Yeah. Have you watched U.S. national team in the last few matches? And what are your thoughts? And what are, what are areas you see that uh, without, well, it, obviously you need to be careful, but um, what are the improvements you've seen from over the, the last three matches? Yeah, so I, I know Greg pr pretty well. Um, he's friends with our technical director. And, and through that, I got to know Greg even uh, before, you know, uh, he was the national team coach. And um and learn from that. And since he's been one, he's been in touch with us on several players to, from U23 to the senior team. And, and, you know, and, and he wants inside Greg's great at uh, just caring about the player's background and, and giving understanding their club situation and giving support to that and, um, and, and connecting with the club coach. Not every national team has done that in the U S or maybe in the world's, but, but Greg's been very thorough with him and his staff to connect with, with the clubs and, and I feel that, I feel that so they're very involved with each player and their development before a camp, during a camp and after a camp. Cause I'll be in a, I'll be in a conversation with Greg during a camp where he's very busy. There's an opportune time for him to work with these players, but he'll, he'll still give the time to connect with us even during camp. So that's, that's shows you the level of commitment uh, and care for the, for the players. You know, I, yeah, I, I see progress. I see progress in terms of personnel. You see more players 
playing at the highest level, whether in MLS or overseas. Uh, young players, I see, I see a, a great opportunity for, for young players. And, and, and I know Greg will, will also consider that veteran players that can help the young players, uh, you know, show them the ropes and, and, and have just have someone with past experiences that are going to guide the young player through and manage their energy, manage their conviction, their fearlessness. You need, you need veterans also to help uh, channel those things with a young group. But I see that. Um, I see the, the, you see the concepts, right? Yeah. The concepts maybe in a, in a final, in a Nations League final against Mexico are not so clear because the game ends up being a war. And, yeah. you know, the saying finals are meant to win, not, not to, to play, play nice, you know? So, um, you know, but I know Greg wants to play well uh, in, in terms of taking risk out of the back. I know uh, you saw the goal, yeah. the first goal we conceded. It was, it was a decision to play a short pass out of the back that got intercepted and that's the price you pay. But what a great, what a great uh, lesson for all of us, even youth yeah. coaches to see when the, when at the senior level, you have to win. Like that's the pressure up there is to win that you can still make those mistakes and still encourage that you still play and find a way to win still despite that. And, and I think that's a, a beautiful example. And you saw the Mexico game, right? That was, a, that was a war. It wasn't a lot too much playing between lines and yeah. it was a lot of risk. They never really abandoned, abandoned no, football. No, you, you didn't see him in no way yeah. abandoned, but you saw a lot of, pra you know, pra more pragmatism, obviously. Sure. And uh, but but then you see the game against Costa Rica and when maybe the pressure's off and playing beautifully and, and between lines and great sequences of combinations and builds up the field and pressing and transition. So positive play. And, and it, I think I think what the positive play does is it gives you a foundation. It gives you courage to play. Whether you're in a war against Mexico in a final, or you're playing, you know, uh, Costa Rica in a friendly or you're playing uh, Belgium in a World Cup game or you're playing Honduras in Honduras with a hundred degree weather. I think what, what, what Greg is in trying to implement in the style of play and then, and the positional play and then possession based and pressure on the ball and attacking oriented. I think he's just creating a good foundation for the players to play with courage. And with that, they're going to have courage to, uh, to, to play against anybody and courage to, create and courage to press because you need courage to press too, to counter press. And it's not just going backwards and defending in your box. It's like, go, go forward in, in the press. I think you see a lot of those elements um, and, you know, he's managing it with the highest pressure at the national team level. So I think it's been really positive and, and, I, and I really like what I see. And you see rotations, you see different guys get different opportunities and, uh, and it seems very comp competitive, but you, and lastly, you see pride. I mean, Again, I keep saying that that game was a war. You you saw a national team fight for the jersey, yeah, uh, fight for each yeah. other. You even had Greg running around, getting the ball, putting it in play. You know, probably he's, maybe he got a warning. I, my league, you get a warning, you get a fine for that. We're not allowed to, like, help put balls. You know, we're not – apparently we're not allowed to grab balls if they go out of play and, and, and give them to the player to gain an advantage. But you saw Greg – he, got, like, crashed into one of his own players or Mexico because that's how – the adrenaline's rushing. I, I just love to see him also show that passion himself. The team showed it. So there's a lot of elements I think have been really positive. Yeah. All right. You have an interesting background. You were a Herman Award winner and you went drafted in the MLS, then went, I think, played in Peru and, um, and had uh, then, you know, became a teacher and, and then and it really evolved into the coaching position and the coaching lifestyle and sort of profession. Um, who are the um, some of the influencers of your uh, style, your career, and why? All right, let me let me try to be somewhat methodical in how I how I answer it, uh, so I'm not going all over the place. I I um, I was a I was a really good youth player. I grew up playing in South Florida, Miami, Florida. Uh, my team, my club team. I mean, we won maybe five, six state championships. We went to regionals. We, I lost two national finals. Uh, I was on youth national teams, U16. I played a U17 World Cup for the U.S. Yep. For Jay Miller. Uh, Jay Hoffman was the assistant. Uh, I played with, you know, some, some great young players at that time. Uh, you know, there were no MLS academies back then, and it was 
you, you didn't play pro unless you left the country at a young age. So I knew college was my path. I went to SMU here in Dallas, Texas. That was my initial connection to Dallas. I played for Shellis Heinemann. Uh, I, I scored a lot of goals in college. I had a, a, a very successful college career. I played a U-20 qualifier, U-20 uh, national team, um, where I played with some greats in the game. Uh, you know, shoot, I, in the U-20s with Tim Howard, with Carlos Bocanegra, Corey Gibbs, Danny Califf, uh, Taylor Twelman, guys that played, Nick Garcia, guys that, that were great in MLS, great in, in international play, senior team players. Um, so that, that, you know, college, uh, after college, I, I wanted to maybe try overseas and my father's from Spain. I was, I thought I was going to get a Spanish passport. Didn't work out. He left Spain at a young age. So he wasn't considered enough of a citizen for me to get my Spanish passport. So I couldn't, I couldn't go that route as easy as I thought. And, and MLS was still new. So, so I, I, I saw that as the next step. I was in the draft. I, I got drafted to San Jose earthquakes. Um, Played for Frank Yallop, uh, played with guys competing with Landon Donovan, Dwayne De Rosario, Ariel Graziani. I'm a, I'm a rookie coming into this depth and, yeah. and not touching the field. You know, I, <laughs> I got very limited. You know, I, it's funny. I look back now and I wish there were reserve teams. I wish there was a U23 team that I could have been a part of at, at San Jose, but, but it just, it wasn't, it wasn't there. It wasn't the situation. And I barely played any minutes my whole first professional year. Uh, I learned a lot. Um, and I loved being a professional, and but but I didn't get the opportunity to play very much. Uh, I got traded to Columbus, and then that didn't. I almost stayed, but I went to Sweden because there was a better opportunity to play. There was a, a coach that said, "Look, I want you to come in and play right away." So I went to second division Sweden. I bounced around. I played eight years, seven clubs in eight years. In Peru, you named Peru. That's the father. That's the country of my father. Um, and, and so I'm proud of that. I got to I got to play the Copa Libertadores. I bounced around. I had my shot in MLS. Fernando Clavijo was one of my coaches, you know, and, and, and this is, I guess you said with my mentors or my influences, I'll, I'll be, I'll be straight to the point here. Shellis Heinemann was absolutely my, my mentor. Uh, he taught me a lot about just discipline, hard work, efficiency, and being a great a, a teammate. And, and it really helped me come alive in, in the college game. He's the one that along with Fernando that hired me to be a part of FC Dallas uh, in the Academy in 2012. So I owe him so much. Uh, Fernando Clavijo was my coach for two years at Colorado Rapids. Uh, bless him. You know, may he rest in peace. Um, he, you know, he, I didn't, I played a lot my first year. I barely played my second year and he ends up, you know, he cut me uh, going into my third year. I, I didn't get a contract renewed and I'll never forget that meeting. I can, I can see it now. I'm in his office and, He's explaining to me with a lot of love and a lot of care that I'm not going to continue. But you know what? I, I think in that moment, uh, I, he showed care and love. And even though I didn't agree with the decision, I wasn't happy. It, I showed respect and love and care back. And six years later, the same guy that cuts me from being a professional in Colorado Rapids, he's hiring me to be an academy coach in FC Dallas. So that teaches me and, and anybody that hears the story a lesson to, you know, show respect, show respect. You have players that you're going to coach. They're not all going to be your best players, but, but love them, show respect, because you can have a future with them. You can have a future with them somehow. Um, and maybe it's just communication, or maybe it's just a, a memory. But, but I think respect is, is always, whether you're the coach or you're the player, have, show respect. Show respect, and I think uh, that will always keep your doors open and, and create opportunities for you. So that's a mentor. My, my last mentor I can mention, well, look, I have a youth coach named Danny Vasquez. He was a brilliant Argentine. He was amazing teaching me as a young player. I will always love him like a father. My own father got me into the game, you know, and, and taught me about the passion of the game. But the, the last mentor I'll mention is, uh, oh crap, I got two more. Uh, I, have, I have Oscar Pereja who taught me every, a lot of things here in the academy. Um, and and that, that ability to transition to being a first team player, which I had to learn a lot and the hard way uh, uh, through Oscar and his staff. And Chris Hayden was a part of that in the club. But Jerry Zank was my prince, was a principal that hired me in the private school uh, in my alma mater uh, when, I, when I was uh, coaching and teaching at the same time. Yeah. And he, he believed in me. He pushed me in front of a, a, an audience of, you know, almost a thousand kids, high school kids. And I had to give a speech about discipline. I, was, I became the dean of students. Did, I was not comfortable doing that. I was, I was not, I was very nervous. 
you know, uh, but he pushed me out of my comfort zone. He believed in me. And he was the first one to support me to go to FC Dallas saying, this is a no brainer. You need to leave and go do this because you're passionate about it. So I'll, I'll never forget him. And he's another one that forgot, may he rest in peace as well. Nice. That's great. Hey, here's an interesting sort of twist uh, or a different direction. Uh, given that the pro um, relegation structure is so important for developing players at the youth level, um, do you think we need to have it at the highest level? I, I didn't say that it, it's, it should be done. <laughs> I, I'm not sure I would actually vote for promotion. I think there's other ways to create really competitive environments at these younger uh, ages, but I'm just telling you what it is a fact in Dallas. Yeah. And it, it, um, the product of it is competitiveness, competitive parents, competitive players. And, and I'm just, it's just my way of grabbing the positive, taking the positive. Yeah. Of yeah. It, right. Okay. That's right. Um, but, but in the, in terms of the, you know, uh, the professional level, I, I think, but by the way, I think um, tournaments are important, like at the young ages. I think there should be competitive tournaments with winners and losers, but then the leagues, you know, are where you can experiment more as a coach. I think that complement is really important. At the senior level, professional, I think, yeah, absolutely. Promotion relegation, is, that's just what they're doing all over the world, and, and it's exciting to see. You saw the last few games in the Premier League and who went up, who went down. You see it in the championship. You see it in South America. I remember when River Plate went down. I mean, that was like a, a tragedy. Um, and, and you know, it's tough. I, I know it affected a lot of lives. And maybe there's some violence that, that took place that, that shouldn't. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, River Plate bounced I back. Know, River went there. down. There's, something's got to happen. Yeah, yeah. So something, changed. Some, something changed. A behavior, yeah. an investment, uh, something, a philosophy it makes you reflect. You audit. You, you have to improve. Yeah. And so... I, I, I believe in that suffering, you know, paying the consequences. But in the U.S., in the culture right now, in professional sports, and in the position of MLS, especially with everything that's gone on, I, I don't see that as a solution anytime soon. I don't think it's the right thing anytime soon for MLS um, or, or for or even USL Championship. I think we need to be very supportive of making all of our franchises work in the in those markets get those up and running get full stadiums consistently in every market get a history get histories of years of competition but in the in the far future sorry in the far future there's going to be maybe two teams in dallas there's going to be two teams in in northern california there's already two teams in la there maybe there's going to be three there's yeah. already two teams in new york maybe there's going to be two in atlanta i'm just saying I think there's going to be more investment. There's going to be more clubs, more fans, more growth of the game. It will get to a point where it's you. You probably maybe you have to do it. And and I do think in the far future, we potentially will will get to that. But sports, professional sports culture, uh, it doesn't doesn't favor it that. It costs in, a lot of money. Country. It co it can cost you a lot of money, and I don't think we're there anywhere soon. Yeah. Uh, but it the is Dutch I know have a hybrid conversation. I don't vote for it anytime soon. Yeah. That's for sure. <laughs> the Dutch have a hybrid where after you apply to go up because the jump is so big from top level amateur to professional. It used to be, you know, it, you moved up and down. The Germans still have it. I'm yeah. a big fan of promotion relegation also in the youth. I think it, it's um, if a coach wins, if a club wins, they move up. They're rewarded for mm -hmm. their efforts. And if they lose, they go down. And, and it puts a pressure, I, I think, especially um, in the older youth game, that it's a pressure that players, if we don't have your competitive environment that you have in FC Dallas or in Dallas, I think it's the final part that reveals the player that might make the, the step. So, uh, yeah. So I'll, I'll say two things on that. One, uh, I like the stimulus of promotion relegation in the young ages. Uh, I think I think it's important, though, that if that is a decision made by a, a you know a association yep. or yep. organization or whatever, there's there has to be a complement and a, an education of our coaches to to also teach the game the right way. I, I'm sorry, yep. but but you know, and, and I can understand that maybe playing direct to the to the nine in a U10 game is going to develop a good nine, a post up nine, a a strong nine that can hold the ball up and yep. play with pressure on his back and maybe a develop a center back that can skip lines. And, but there's so many other players on that field losing opportunities to develop to their potential. Yeah. Uh, the game is not played with, with, with the right, um, 
developmental, uh, you know, stimulus. And, and I, I was in a tournament with my son. He's seven years old. It was a U8 tournament. Super competitive. The team that won, I mean, they literally, the goalkeeper, the first thing he did was sprint to the top of the box, punt it as far as he could, turn the last line. And, and you had all these kids chasing their ball down and scoring breakaways. And, I, <laughs> and yeah. I, those parents are celebrating like they win the World Cup and that coach is holding the trophy and the kids have – and I'm just like, you know what? I love the competitive nature, but I just can't stand the soccer. It's just, yeah. it's, it's just it's sad. Like it's, it's, it's sad. It's painful. Level. It's yeah. painful that they don't realize the goalkeeper is never going to play a high level. The center back's never going to play a high level. Those outside backs are just defenders. They're not supporting the attack. The midfielders are being skipped. All they're doing is ball winning. They're not trying to play through them in any way. And, and it's just, it's just very limiting to what it's developing. So yeah. I like the promotion relegation. You know, I don't like if a coach comes to me and says, oh, my God, we played perfect. We played beautiful soccer. I'm so proud of them. But we lost 5-0, you know, but but we played great. You know, I, I still think there has to be uh, – I wouldn't let a coach get away with that. Like, hold them yeah. accountable. They need to have the players not just play good soccer but compete well also. Uh, I'm facing that myself as a professional coach. So, I, you know, I, I, I'm i learning that myself. Yeah. But I think you, our, play, our coaches should be competitive but teaching the game – the right way dominate in the style of play but also dominate in the score in the score and, and challenge your coaches to do both yeah regarding regarding the um, what was the you said you said the what was the last part you said with um with your promotion relegation in the youth uh ah. just the coaches clubs uh i don't know people you do well as a coach do well as a player yeah I, I mean i'm not a big fan of of them uh, we promote but we don't always relegate and we try and educate the people about it. We have a very strong coaching education. We really try and have people keep the ball on the ground and, and ensure a style of play that we think is um, more conducive to development because players are getting more touches on the ball, more football actions. Um, but uh, it's not always that way. And then we try to not do it um, say 13s and above. Yes. Okay. So there you go. So that, now I remember my point. I would, I would, the other education I would give or even restriction is, is in terms of playing time. I do think, yeah. especially in those youngest ages, you're going to have, if, if a coach is pressured to just win at all costs, the bigger, stronger, faster kids are going to play. And you're going to see a lot of neglect of those, you know, those undersized yeah. and those underdeveloped kids. So I would just make sure there's a consideration in that um, so that there's some type of, I don't know. You know, it's hard. It, you, you, not every club can can do buyer reference and and like uh you know know who's an early developer, or late developer. I know that takes an investment and, and yep. medical type of support, but I, I would just get creative to make sure that there's some level of a uh, rotation of players be getting the opportunity to play because those even if a kid's not ready or physically they're out of their element, they still need to learn to compete and get on the field and That's help. Something them. guaranteed. They need to help the team. And and you're, and. And your teammates, your teammates need to learn. The higher talent needs to learn how to make the kid next to them better, not just play with good players all the time. They need to yeah. learn to help coach up that player next to them on the field. Kids Is that something them. you do in FC Dallas? You have yeah, so, make sure so you, people. You said something about uh, that that competitive part being that last kind of determination of a player becomes pro. I couldn't agree more. So if I if I show you whatever one of my random. FC Dallas, one of my older uh, FC Dallas presentations of, of development and what, what we prioritize, you have this pyramid and the foundation of, you know, you have a, what, what, what we say, the five criteria, right, for us. And, and last is their athletic, you know, their athletic tools. Yeah. And that, that includes, not, that's not just big, strong, fast, big, what is big, you know, like I'm just saying you need to have coordination. Uh, you need to have some level of uh, footwork you need to have uh, you know depending on the position uh, a certain speed a change of direction and you know endurance soccer players football players need endurance so so absolutely the athletic part for depending on the position there's a minimum standard for sure there there's a yeah. minimum standard for sure there that's important to be a professional I think the second category for me is um, I would say if I'm not looking at my thing and I don't want to get my order right it's going to be technique. It's going to be technique. Um, so they need to have technique. 
and it's not just juggling. It's it's hitting yeah. a mid range, short range ball, curve, put effect outside of the foot, receiving, yeah. receiving in the air, receiving in the bounce, dribbling techniques, passing techniques, heading is important. I know there's rules with that with concussions, <laughs> but madre mio, at least use like a balloon for heading technique. Um, you know, I, I would say uh, technique is you need to have a minimum standard technique to play at the highest level. And that's why I think that's important at those youngest ages. And that's the, the, the priority of those youngest ages to, yes, you want your kids to love the game, but teach them through with technique, good technique. Um, the second is, or sorry, the third I have is um, decision making. Decision making. Uh, so the application of the technique, uh, reading the game taking in information and then putting out information with your decisions and applying it with the technique, but with a good decision and the timing of the decision. Right. Uh, and then we get into two areas that uh, to me are those last pieces of determining you have two players, you have player blue player green. And why, why does this player make it or not make it? And it's two last elements. And this, the fourth one is, there's a, uh, a competitiveness, like you said, there's a personality, there's a bite, there's, a, there's an edge to this player that they hate to lose, they want to win. Um, maybe some are more extroverted in how they show it, they're vocal, and others are just introverted, but they're, they're you know, they're son of a bitches on, on the field, you know, they're, they're, they're going to find a way to kill you. And, and, they, they, uh, and maybe they can be great human beings off the field, but they certainly uh, want, to, want to kill you on the field. So I think that competitive part's important. And the last for us is mental strength, mentally strong. Um, and I know a good human being, those are maybe that kind of could be like the six. You need to have great human beings as a foundation. That's a, that's a, that's a yeah. no brainer. But when you get into and dissect the details, what we find my experience in all these homegrowns you've talked about, the ones that make it to that highest level are the ones that have strong mental skill, strong, strong mental skill. They're starting, they're not starting, they're injured, they're not injured. They're winning, they're losing, their, their father's sick, their sister's sick, their, they, their girlfriend broke up with them. Um, whatever the case may be, they find it, they're, they are just, they show constant resilience. They, they don't make that many, they find a way not to make excuses. They're not victims of these things. They push through, they're, they're winners. Like they have a mental strength uh, that, that is impressive. That's impressive. And I can give you examples of a lot of these kind of guys um i coach weston mckinney and what a winner you know i remember there was a game where there was an issue with registration we got docked three points it was going into the playoffs and uh they took three points away from us it was kind of embarrassing like we won the game one zero against the dynamo u17 but because it was a registration issue on a player that one of my assistants you know whatever i'm responsible i'm the coach they they made it three zero on the on the score. Remember in uh, what yeah. was that? Oh, yeah. USSDA, and the guys were so pissed. You know, like and I remember Weston being the first, but like, hey, that's good. That means that that we're, we're pissed now. This is motive. Like he's already taken this negative, yeah. experience, this negative uh, moment and taking it into a, a turning it into a positive. Weston yeah. McKinney was in the national team camp and uh, with, with residency, but he always had a pep in his step, and he came back yeah. to us kind of defeated, not playing a lot with the U-17 national team, not making that, that roster to the World Cup uh, like his teammate Alex Andejas did, but he was always positive, wanted to compete, loving the game. And, and I'm not surprised to see him now a beast on the field at, at the highest level. Reggie Cannon, you know, I can give you stories about him. Brian Reynolds. Brian Reynolds is for two years not touching the field, just training, trying to learn, get better, playing academy games. Didn't touch the field as a professional for the first team for two years but do, not losing patience, learning from Reggie, learning from Reggie, learning from Reggie. And then when Reggie got transferred, the guy grabs his opportunity. He's a great example for that mental strength part, yeah. you know? Uh, so I, I can, the list can go, goes yeah. on and on. Kellen Acosta, Kellen was the first guy when I was a coach of the U18s in 2012, Kellen hands me, the, he was the first player to give me his registration to the academy, to the academy. You know, this is a senior professional that could easily be the last guy to give me the registration, kind of be hard to get in touch with because he's focused on the first team. He knew that by being the best in the academy, he was going to be the best with the, that he can be on the first team. And it's not every kid gets it. Some of them get it later. Some of them never get it. But the ones that get that sooner than later and have those other elements I talked about, those kids can make it. Those kids can make it. And they're going to not just debut. Any kid can debut. 
Any kid can debut. I've seen all of those 22 debut. But the ones that have careers are the ones that have, I believe, that those last few, those last elements that yeah. give them that, that career. That's interesting. Vanger says stamina and mental toughness as well. <laughs> that because the stamina to make that jump from 18 to 22, 23. Oh, you got to be the mental beast. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Stamina, the, uh, energy. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, hey, we want to be, um, this is fascinating. We can keep going, but we want to be uh, respectful of your time. Uh, you have a big match in what, eight days against Minnesota? Um, yeah. No. And look, no. I'm good. I, I got another 10, 15 minutes in me if, okay, if you guys want to keep going, okay? Okay, great. Then here's one. Um, being a former college player, can college soccer be relevant to the future of U.S. soccer? What changes would you like to see it become uh, in order to make it become more relevant? I think there's always a place for college. I, you see it's, it's gotten less and less impactful uh, for that higher top tier player, um, but it's still, it's still there. You saw uh, DK uh, Daryl DK score an international goal uh, against Costa Rica. That's a player that came out of UVA, played two seasons in UVA. Um, you know, you still you're still going to have players play college. Reggie Cannon scored in that game. He played a season in UCLA. Um, you know, I, I think college is still going to be relevant. It's still going to be always in our tradition and culture of the game in this country. What can improve it? Uh, yeah, I think you know Sasha. Well, he's fighting the the good fight to to create. Uh, longer season create I think yeah. it was great to see a spring season can there be a fall and a spring season or a continued season so there's more games there's more continuation of periodization technical tactical periodization so players are learning competing more longer periods um, I'm not a fan of the substitution rules I, I know it's it's part of the college game that everyone participates but it, it really it's really hard to control a rhythm of a game when it's just constant subs it's and guy it's just <laughs> You know, the game is so fast. And sometimes when it's too fast, it's not as smart. It's not as smart. And especially that's what you want in developing higher level players. Uh, but, but I think there'll always be a place. Um, I'm not, I don't see a near future where college is, uh, is obsolete. I, I know there's more players skipping college, becoming professionals through the academy. Uh, but, but I think college still is going to have its place. You're still going to have players that are not clear pros at 17, 18 that weren't invested by their academy and, the, and they need college and they go to college and they, they all of a sudden they get it and they, they take the next step and they can be successful at the next level. So I know certainly in MLS at the world-class, you know, U S national team level. Yeah. I'm not sure college is going to be the pathway to yeah, a I think you're sure. player in 10 years. I, <laughs> I think that that could fall short in the next 10 years. Uh, but it, you just saw an example with Daryl DK the other, the other day and, and never say never. So, but, I, but I think, uh, yeah. For, for the game to grow in, in these communities, there's thousands of colleges and that they all play college soccer, that's the opportunity for the game to grow in these smaller cities, these smaller towns. So I think there's it's valuable no matter what, directly or indirectly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, interesting. Um, in uh, terms of tactics, what should a young player learn first? From a... Uh, first... Yeah, <laughs> I, I think it's, it's never, I'm not sure there's a first, but there's a, there's a several first. I think I, 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 I'll go back to saying, you know, take care of the ball. Uh, I think the player should have a connection with the ball, should be able to walk alongside a ball with the ball, juggle a ball, hit, hit the ball against the wall. But I think, I think ball mastery is, is certainly in that top three things that you should be doing first, but but be careful you don't isolate it and you you connect it with playing. So two versus two. I play with my my I have I have two kids. My wife never played the game, but I force every once a week we're going to play two versus two and we're going to do round robin and we're going to play two versus two. And that's going to teach them to play, how to attack, how to defend, how to connect, combine, how to uh, to, to to press the ball or cover the player that's pressing the ball. There's so many elements. So I, I would say first is ball mastery and tied for first is, is, you know, play small sided, play small sided. And the decisions are going to come out naturally. And, and even if you don't have an opponent, play one versus one, play one versus one all the time, play one versus one, play one versus one with your kid or have them go home and play with dad or mom or the siblings, because that's going to teach them to, 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 to be better.
All right. Interesting. Um, what are, what is your plan or what is sort of your, um, uh, a training plan for you? Um, especially I guess, since most people are in youth say from 16 to 19, what would a training plan look like in terms of the rhythm of the training? Are you talking about in, in a, in a when week you were, when season? you were in the Academy? Yeah. So within just or in a, a single session, sorry, yeah. pull out a, I don't know, Tuesday, a Wednesday, a Thursday, yeah. What would a, tra a typical training for you as an FC Dallas uh, youth head coach, because the first team's different, yeah. uh, but what does a typical training rhythm look like? Warm up, first training, you know, drill. So for, for the first team, and, and you, you, you asked me about my mentors, and, and, and I'm going to throw one, one more in there. Um, you know, my staff, or not one more, but I have mentors in my staff, and one, one you know really well. He's, he's younger than me, but he's taught me so much about technical tactical periodization. He, he keeps yeah. our... Uh, our team in line and on schedule and, and progressing. And that's, that's Mikey Vadas. Mikey Vadas is yep. invaluable to us in, in helping us in this, in this area that you're talking about. So with the senior team, a typical week, let's say we're playing a Saturday and then the next Saturday. So a typical micro cycle, no midweek fixture. Um, we're going to do game. Uh, so game plus one off. I know some clubs do like a region after the, the day of a game, but we do off on the Sunday. And then we do uh, a region uh, with on, on the Monday with uh, the players that got significant minutes and then a, a training, a reserve training with the guys that need minutes. And then sometimes we'll read the group. If we didn't travel and we think we can do a little something different, we'll get creative. We'll do like a passive, sorry, an active region, which is like a little bit of Rondo, some positional play with the guys that started, but very stationary, very stationary. So that, that would be the, 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 the Monday. And sometimes uh, the guys that, that the reserve guys that need minutes, we'll mix them with some of our second team guys that need minutes and we'll play a very productive, like nine versus nine and get them some fitness, but playing on, uh, on Tuesday, it's, it's, it's a day that we, we want to start spiking them in terms of uh, load. Um, not so much distance, more in terms of like high speed runs. And we do that in a lot of kind of small sided games. We do in duels, one versus ones, two versus twos, three versus twos can be positional on the flank. It could be general. There's something that Mikey does fantastic with us is flying changes, right? Is, is like two versus one, then three versus two, yeah. four versus three, create, create long, big transitions. Sometimes we'll do it in a shorter space. Sometimes we'll do it long. Again, can be general, can be positional. Uh, but we try to do Tuesdays in these small pictures on the field with uh, intensity uh, and, 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 uh, and repetitions and competition and transition. So that's the Tuesday. Wednesday, we'll start to go bigger spaces, some more, um, you know, functional and positional functional one or two lines. And then we'll walk through some situations. Well, actually, we'll do some probably positional play, some Rondo positional play, and then go through some situations. Let's say we want to work on building against a high press. We'll create those situations, repeat it, have transitions, Transitions need to be in everything, guys. Everything. You shouldn't be doing anything without a transition because it's not real to the game. Don't ever complain about a forward that's a one-way forward or a lazy forward. That's your responsibility to make them a two-way forward. So when they're doing one-on-one -on -one attacking and they lose the ball, they need to get the ball back so that you're going to build a two-way forward. So have transitions in everything you do. And let's say you're working on the build against high press. When they lose the ball, have them transition and get into a uh, a defensive net and, and get the ball back. And that's part of your build. Sometimes you're going to lose the ball on your build, get it back and you're going to build even better. So it's, I think transitions always that, that, that commonality needs to be in every element of your training. You can even get creative and put in your technical work, but uh, the Wednesdays, like I said, are more big spaces, competitive 11 versus 11. Let's start seeing what our lineup's going to look like. Let's start setting up opposition, like what we're going to see in the weekend. And then Thursday, we'll bring it way down. This is something that, that Mikey was very clear with us that we needed to probably create more freshness. Thursday, we come way down. We do a lot of like reps, functional reps, finishing, crossing, finishing, um, some patterns, but no opposition or very limited opposition or shadow opposition. And then maybe, you know, we'll, 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 uh, we'll end with some light stimulus of reps of set pieces. And then Friday, we'll, we'll start to bring it up a little bit, activate them. Still a light day, really short, but bring it, start to bring it up. We'll spike them with some small-sided competition, three teams to the goals. Um, we'll go into some walkthrough and create some real-life situations. We'll, we're not even afraid to play 11 versus 11 for six minutes to, to, to spike them a little bit, break them up, 
and feel, give them a taste of like, oh, they want to play. And, and, and then we'll finish with set, so again, more set pieces, attacking, defending set pieces. And we try to always do this little bit of IDP Thursday, Fridays, give at least 10 minutes, 15 minutes to the guys to get a little extra reps and what they want uh, or what they need. So that's kind of that typical week for us, the first team level. Of course, probably similar with the United second team, similar with the 19s. When you start getting into the 17s, uh, you can be a little more flexible in how you want to manage your week, your ups and downs. I would say U15, you can even take more risk. You can even go Thursday, Friday harder, more competition. Don't be afraid to go into your games with more fatigue with the players who are young. You have subs. <clears throat> you know, I, I think we, we shouldn't be overthinking uh, or, or doing a first team periodization like, like we are uh, with, with the first team as we are with the, fi the 15s, the 14s. I think the game becomes less and less the priority in your planning of the week as they get younger. Certainly at those U10, U9, U8, the last thing you need to be doing is, game, is planning for your game, freshness. Just train those kids work make them work hard every moment you've got them and work smart every moment you've got them um, i don't know if you have any other specific questions with with kind of training sessions or days no, of I, yeah i have one um you uh, reading um uh, and following your team you are looking you're pretty satisfied with your possession you're looking to get more attacking players in the final part and to create more chances whip in more crosses get more numbers in the box how have you been working on that so um, I won't share something with you. It's, it's completely private and in-house, but I'll share kind of our process um, a bit. We've actually been very dangerous. So if you look at our average shots, shots on target, crossing yeah. volume, if you look at our danger, so if there's a stat, uh, expected goals, right? So our stat and expected goals is 1.5. We're, we are fifth in MLS in expected goals, fifth, fifth out of 20, five out of 27 teams. But the expected goals uh, are just showing like you're creating shots in and around the box that are have a good distance, a good angle, and not as many numbers between the ball. And, the, and, and if you have a lot of numbers between the shot and the goal, it, the, your shot, your expected goal goes down, right? Or it can go up or down. So there's these, these valuations they, they put on each shot, each cross, each moment near the box. And, and so we're average, we're, we should be efficiently scoring 1.5, at least 1.5 on an average per game. But but uh, we haven't, we haven't, we've been only scoring about 1.1. So if you take our efficiency, like take the goals we've scored and then take the, the, the goals we should be scoring uh, and you, you do a formula, then you start to see, you know, we're, we're, we're just not rewarding ourselves. We're, we're creating a lot of danger. I'm happy with our builds. I'm happy with our possession, but you know, the game is about scoring and not, and not conceding. And so, but that that that's a collective effort. That's a that's that's the great opportunity we have next to keep working on those little details. And it's not one or two players' uh, fault. It's our team. We can score on set pieces. We can score on counterattacks. We can score uh, from a midfield run, a late run. So we can score with outside backs. So we just gotta we gotta keep working, keep believing. Not there's nothing really to change drastic. We gotta keep believing in that, but being more efficient in that, in that last third. And I believe I believe we're gonna do it. Now, what we can continue to do as well is balance ourselves defensively because at the end of the day, um, you don't need to score five goals to win a game. And if you do, that's a problem defensively. So we need to continue to work defensively, shore up our team transitions, our counter presses, our mid and low block defending has to continue to, to, to develop. And, and we need to keep balancing ourselves in that way. And, and I think those are some of the lessons we, we've I've been learning that in three years, but, but certainly now in this, this, this micro moment where Things just haven't bounced our way. We're having some solid, I think, really creative performances with good volume. We still want more touches than the last third. We want to keep pushing the team up and getting more sequences in the last third. But, but uh, you know, the game at this level is you got to earn points. You got to win. And there's the fan base. There's ownership. And yeah. that's the pressure. But, but, I, but I know our players are not afraid to, to play with that pressure. Our staff's not afraid. I'm not afraid. And we're going to keep doing it with joy and, and with excitement and what's next. And, and that's what we're working on to try to improve. That's great. I, I mean, I personally, I've watched five of your six games. I didn't see the Colorado, you, but I saw the statistics. You're 66% possession. You had 21 shots on goal, I think six on target. And they had, they had 34% of possession and won three, nothing. I have the feeling that if you, you, once you make that step, you're going to see a run of form. 
Uh, and I think, what is it, uh, Justin or Ferreira that getting him back, I think. Yeah, was, Jesus, yeah, yeah, Ferreira. Ferreira, is yeah, it'd be nice to have him in the competition. And I appreciate that. And look, I do have a, a, a youth development background uh, and, and uh, I'm a product of, of youth development. My staff is the product of youth development. Mikey came from the academy. Peter, uh, my, my medical staff, admin, physical staff came through. And, and so we take a lot of pride in, in our philosophy, but putting it all together, having a young roster, the style of play, and then getting those points to compete and yep. win a cup. Um, I, I said this before, I've yet to see an MLS winner uh, be an all out uh, club, youth development club in their philosophy, um, play a, a style of play that's, that's, you know, trying to dictate and dominate the ball and win the cup. I, I think you've seen two of the three, right? You saw two of the yeah. three, maybe with Atlanta, you saw two, but, but putting all those th together is not easy. It's not yeah. easy. And we're, we're fighting that fight and, uh, we're learning a lot, but, but I appreciate that, that, uh, that observation. And we're going to keep trying to, because at the, at the end of the day, look, Colorado's fans were celebrated like no other. They beat us 3-0. So we, we didn't, the Quakes, we didn't the get the job game. done. We didn't get you the job done. could have been 3 against the Quakes in the first match. You yeah, could have been 3, one within 30 seconds. You could have been 2 nothing. Yeah. You, know, yeah. you should have had a PK. Then they get a PK. Yeah. It's, I mean, that but it, that's the game. The game is uh, – yeah. it may seem like it's not just. It may seem cruel. But I think the game shows the truth. Yeah. You've got you've to gotta make plays in your defensive end and your attacking end and and that's uh those are elements that yeah. you gotta always stimulate and and uh it's a good lesson um for all of us no matter the age and we're gonna keep working and progressing but i i believe we have the roster yeah. the players the people to to take that next step and uh not just try to control and dominate a game but, but get the end result for our fans and, and we we want to do that for them so we got to keep working all right. Well, hey, um, with that, I uh, let's wrap it up. And I want to thank you. I think your franchise has is um, a trailblazer as you talk about the number of players in professional football. We need references and to have a club that is a reference for using youth, developing, identifying, developing, committing the resources and bringing them into the first team is an example for our the professional clubs in our country. For that, I know we're all youth development people, so we thank you for that. We hope that the um, the ownership commits to that for long term and and always provides that example because the players you're you see coming through your uh, program are great. So um, thank you, Ben. I yeah, appreciate the word. I forward. appreciate the the support and admiration from from California. Um, I you know I I still have a connection to that area. I lived there for a year and I'll never forget it. And whether I played only eight games or yeah. or not, I, I I'm always gonna want want this country and clubs like yours to keep growing. And it's a pleasure and it's an honor to be on on this program. Thank you. And I'll got, I'll send one last message just to everybody. No matter what, whatever we do, uh, we we it's about developing and not using. It's all about developing. And if you can develop uh, as your focus and not use. I think that's always something I always share with my academy staff and the youth coaches. Don't use your players, don't use your people. Develop them, push them, you create relationships, hold them to high standards, and then you get that high performance, high potential. So I wish you guys all the best and uh, hope to join you soon again. And thank you, Ben, it's been a pleasure, man. Take care. Likewise, good luck versus Minnesota. Thank you, let's yeah. go. Vamos. Yeah, exactly. That's <laughs> fucking point. Vamos, let's go, let's go. Get those points. Thank you, guys. Take care. Thanks, Lucid. Thanks, everybody. Bye. -bye.